All right, everyone, welcome to the Tennis.com podcast. I am one of your hosts, Nina Pantic, and this episode, I am joined by Irina Falcone. Irina, hi. Hey, guys, how's it going? Our special guest is someone who was a legend in college, Julia Elbaba. Hi, girls. Thanks for having me. <laughs> a brief rundown of Julia's incredible tennis career. She was number one in college as a junior at UVA, four-time All-American, set a record at UVA singles with 133 wins, and then took her skills to the pro, pro tour, which has been ranked as high as number 372. So we want to talk about your career, your life, your tennis story, and kind of what's next for you because you're in New York. Um, I guess first, where have you been for this whole pandemic? Have you been in New York or where have you been? So my father is a frontline healthcare worker in New York. So I decided instead of like kind of staying away from him in the house, I thought, you know, let me just go to back to my, you know, stomping grounds at Virginia where things were kind of magical for me there. I just, honestly, they say the best four years are in college and I never believed it. And when it, I actually went to school, I totally understood why they say that. I can't get enough of that place. And I feel like many other tennis players that had attended UVA feel the same way because we were kind of all in quarantine together in Charlottesville from about mid-March to up until a couple of weeks ago, we were kind of all there, not necessarily hanging out, but we were all doing our thing in Charlottesville. Some people were hitting, but, you know, just being there was so nice. And the situation was is a lot better there than New York as far as coronavirus. So with regards to your college experience, I mean, I went to college for two years and I mean, you're clearly very excited talking about your college experience. What would you say like sticks out? What is it that you love so much about it? I just really appreciate the team environment of tennis and kind of playing for a team. I actually, that's the hardest thing I've been dealing with after college just kind of transitioning back to that individual lifestyle. So playing for a team, playing for your coaches, um, the school, the fans, something about that was just, it brought me to life every day and it was, it was beautiful. Um, and then also I'm a person that thrives in a situation where I have more than one thing going on, multitasking. So doing school with tennis, I really like that busy lifestyle and that's kind of actually why I started my own podcast as a way to have something else to juggle with professional tennis right now. It's a <laughs> tricky time. I feel like especially you're, you know, you just turned 26 and it sounds like you're still very connected to your college experience, but you did take your skills to the pro tour. Can you tell us where you're at in your career with tennis? Yeah. So up until the beginning of 2019, I was going strong with competing, traveling around the world. Um, and then unfortunately, my body is very easily injured. I have a very muscular physique and it's just pr primarily like just genetics. People always think, what do you do in the gym that your body is so muscular and strong? I'm like, oh, like you can ask my mom and dad. <laughs> But honestly, I feel like the muscle mass mass um, makes me more prone to injury. And I'm actually now I'm healthy, but I was dealing with an injury for the past year, a torn UCL in my right elbow, which is like, um, you probably know it as like Tommy John. If you have to get surgery, it's Tommy John surgery. Uh, but I didn't need that. Luckily, I was actually ready to start competing again once quarantine hit. So it's kind of bad luck with the timing. What's been one of the things that you've found other than the fact that you have to play for yourself now? I mean, being on the tour is not easy. A lot of people just think that, oh, I was a good college player. You know, now I'm going to just transition easily into the tour. But um, what was kind of the most shocking thing for you? Definitely the adjustment to just being on the road by yourself. Obviously, 
if you know you're doing really well you can bring a whole entourage and it's great physios a massage therapist family all your support system but also i adore on court coaching it just really works well for me and i get really tight and nervous on the tennis court so having that coach um during matches especially in college i definitely thrived in that environment so i'm actually very um much like into us trying to have coaching during matches in pro tennis i think that would just be super cool tennis is like the only sport that doesn't have that like why <laughs> i mean it seems to be changing a lot though especially now that we've had this long layoff or hiatus things are are open to change but there's been some kind of bad changes going on uh, i know the usta had some bad news coming out of lake nona but also out of new york so how does this, I guess it's the, the closure of a certain program, you can describe it better for us. How does this change at the USTA affect you, Julia? Yeah, so the night before my birthday, I received really bad news from, we had a Zoom meeting, um, like all of the USTA New York, that program, all my coaches and the directors and stuff, they had us on and they said, you know, due to financial reasons, unfortunately, the USTA New York program will be shutting down, which is player development um, in New York uh, starting July, the last day of July, I think it's 31 days, I'm not sure. Um, so that's really hard because I've always been against, unfortunately, moving to a different state for tennis. I never really was one of those kids or players that wanted to move to Florida to play tennis or move to a different state. I'm just such a homebody and I love being around my family. So this is like tough news and I kind of have to reassess everything and see where I am mentally if it's something that I, you know, need to just so it's just a lot of decisions have to be made right now. It's tough. Obviously. I mean, I can't imagine hearing that news. It's tough. I just recently also lost my coach and my trainer. They were both uh, laid off. So it was a tough time in the last couple of weeks for people that are involved with the USTA. But um, with that being said, I mean, I know that you're a homebody, but I mean, people always talk about sacrifices and all the th things that you have to kind of put to the side if you want to be a professional tennis player would you consider moving now now that you're a little older and kind of have your back against the wall yeah uh that's a great question right now it's just deciding between whether you want to play tennis or you want to just end the career and so at this point it's like yeah I want to continue so I, I'll have to make the sacrifice obviously um another thing but I'd have to be a little lucky is if maybe they start another great program up in New York. We have so many great players up here. You have Christina McHale, Jamie Loeb, Christy Ahn, Varvara Lepachenko, among so many others, and even younger girls that are also awesome. So we like it would take a lot for them to, I feel like, to not have another program start up here. And I'm sure like we'll me and like the other girls in New York will have to talk and figure out a, like a different program we can do because I don't know I, and I know I spoke to Christy a few months ago and she likes being in New York as well she moved from like Georgia to be back in New York with her family it's something about us New Yorkers we love being in New York I don't know why <laughs> New York is the best. I am biased. I live here and I agree. I can understand why and also wanting to be near home. It's also totally natural. But given the current state of affairs, you know, have you put a lot of thought or any thought into what you would do if you were not a tennis player? That's probably one of the hardest things I think for all three of us is our identity has always been tennis from a very young age and it's hard to let that go. It sounds like you're not letting that go, but have you thought about what else you might do? So the only times I've really visited that thought is through my injury. And so this was a serious one. I was out for over a year and yeah, now way over a year. So I've been putting my UVA degree to use. <laughs> uh, my major was media studies. That's what the major was called. And I decided I want to get into some sports media. I've been working at a, like a news company out in Long Island called Newsday. And it's been really cool. Obviously, there's not 
any sports going on right now, but um, I've been taking on some like news stuff, such as like the protests. It's been cool kind of diving into other passions of mine. And, uh, and but at the end of the day, it makes me realize how much I really do love tennis because there's nothing better than running around a tennis court in like the beautiful weather and when we have beautiful weather in New York, that is. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it makes you really appreciate what you have. Hey everyone, you're listening to the Tennis.com podcast with special guest, former college number one, Julia Elbaba. She's telling us all about her four years at UVA. Keep listening. And you also have this podcast. So I've listened to a few of your episodes. I know you had Christina McHale and so have we, someone that we're all friends with. And it's nice to kind of catch up with your friends but you also had a really tough episode with Sophia Zook that really shook me because I didn't even know she'd retired. She retired at like 19, 20 years old. She was ranked almost top 100. Were you surprised by how that conversation went? Because she kind of has a really negative relationship with tennis and you sound like you do not. Was that tough? Yeah, I was so excited to have her on because I knew it would be a different perspective, more of maybe like the negative side. And it's it's amazing because she's accomplished so much, even up until the time she retired, I guess. Yeah. Um, I was like a lot of the points she made were so spot on, though. Like people don't know what happens behind the scenes, you know, the days of travel, the preparation. They see the moments, you know, when Bianca Andrescu wins the U.S. Open and goes down on her knees and cries in front of so many people. And like it's the most amazing thing ever but then they don't see the other stuff we all have to go through and that's kind of like the points that Sophia was touching upon a lot um but I think they're so important because to us tennis players have to do so much to get to where we are and I think that just like the public eye needs to see it and or at least be educated about it I liked having her on it was a good perspective it's crazy how now, though, like all these players have gotten a chance to sit at home for three months against their will. It just I, I'm interested or even a sad way interested to find out how players change from this. You know, will people retire because the hiatus is too long, especially players that are rank, rank lower. But on a more positive note, one of your other past guests on your podcast is a former college player named Hannah Burner. And she happens to be on a reality show called Summer House that I have watched. I'm a Bravo TV fan, um, below deck for life, but the show is also awesome. And you have a little, I mean, on your Instagram, I saw the photo that you were on an episode of the past season, I believe season four. Season four, right. How did that come about? Because you're on reality TV. (laughs) Yeah, on Bravo, who would have thought? Wow, that that day was very eye-opening. So I actually went to two parties two back-to-back weekends. So I got a lot of, you know, I got a lot of new information and it was just crazy to see Hannah in this environment. She lived that intense tennis life, which, you know, people were really into their diet and healthy eating and no, not really any drinking. Um, just a healthy, healthy lifestyle. I, you know, you know what, what I mean, girl, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so it was just really interesting to see, like, I didn't know Hannah too well back in the college days, but she said she was the top player for her Wisconsin women's tennis team. So she must have been pretty great. Um, so to see her in like an environment that I want to say is pretty ratchet. It was pretty ratchet. Um, There was just so much going on. I felt definitely out of place. Sometimes I'm just sitting there observing and like saying like, is this real? Like it was very weird. And there were like a lot of camera people while they were filming and well, obviously, (laughs) but it just, it was very interesting. It's crazy to see a tennis player, like a tennis player, make it to reality TV. You know, that that's what has me most fascinated by that whole storyline. Yeah, it's definitely not something you see every day. Um, 
I actually, before I went in, I had to sign papers that they are allowed to use any footage of me in it. So I think I was on camera a couple of times. I was talking to one of the new newer members, Jules Dawood. And it was funny because we both have the same name and she's Middle Eastern, just like me. So, you know, girls, when they find something they have in common with another girl, they're like, oh my God, like we're sisters, we're twins. So that's like, they're like, ah, picture. <laughs> Your New York accent really came out there. Really? Oh gosh, it comes out from time to time. I've been also watching a lot of Curb Your Enthusiasm over um, quarantine. I feel like I'm getting that New York accent a lot right now. But no, it was, it was super cool. And some people, I'm glad you mentioned it, Nina. Some people have been noticing me on that show, even though it was a very little bit of the episode. <laughs> I would be so, so nervous to go to a party and drink or anything and be videotaped my entire day. And also to be like in a bikini for it, I would be so anxious. Yeah, I mean... Do I have to say like how bad my tan lines were? You know, I have a muscular physique. So I was like, oh, my thighs, I need to suck in here. I, whew, talking about body image, I was, I was worried. <laughs> was it everything you thought it would be? It was crazier because you saw a booty shake in here. You saw tons of tequila there. You saw... I mean, I didn't attend normal high school. I was homeschooled, so I never really had that true high school experience. So I didn't really see everything until I went to college, and then my eyes were pretty much opened up there. But then there's Bravo TV, which is on the other end of the spectrum. That's a whole new level. <laughs> you seem so innocent and angelic. This is incredible. You went to college, like four years of college. I think you've seen something, but yeah, I mean, it sounds like you were definitely focused on tennis and it shows in your, in your resume. I mean, four time all American, you don't do that by going to frat parties. It's difficult because as much as you want to live a normal college life, we technically, we have a fall and a spring season while the fall is only individual stuff. It's you're missing so much school still from being on the road. You have all Americans. You had, um, at the time it was uh, national indoors in New York. You have a ton of turnings. I missed like 40 days of school in the fall. So it's so much still. So you basically have seasons all year long, tennis seasons. So like to find a free Saturday with no matches the next day and making sure your school's still on track is like nearly impossible. Well, I mean, that's the thing, uh, you know, your season in college is all year long and then season in pro tennis is all year long. I mean, it's nonstop. So it, it's been, I think, very shocking for some of these players because all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, I get to stay home for three months. Because even during off season, it's like you're training all the time. But guess what? Gyms and tennis courts weren't really open. Um, so in, in like the last three months, I mean, have you taken up any new hobbies? Have you done anything other than just, you know, dwell on the fact that you couldn't play tennis yeah you know it's it's very true I was actually chatting about this with JC Aragon and we were saying we're just like picking up a book for the first time and actually reading for fun which is so foreign to us but besides you know really taking on my podcast I I've been really trying to get guests every week and kind of chat with them catch up um, hear their story, what they've been up to. That's been a great way to not only socialize and get to know people over quarantine, but kind of balance ideas around of how you can, you know, become better in some aspect of your life. So CC Bell has really encouraged me to try to cook more. So that's been exciting. Um, Wow, I'm drawing a blank now what everyone else taught me, but I just know that besides cooking, cleaning, and podcasting, that stuff has really kept me busy. And also, I really appreciate a good workout now because it just feels good. It makes you feel good the whole day. Irina, How about can you relate. Guys? Irina works out a ton. Irina can probably relate to that more than me, but we both do a lot of reading. 
I, uh, I don't know. I had a hard time with like working out after, like after I stopped playing tennis, I had a really hard time with it. I think mostly because I like associated it with tennis and because I wasn't a tennis player anymore, I felt really not in the mood. I was like, why would I work out? But now I'm an adult and I've pulled it together and I really enjoy Pilates, you know, because I live in Brooklyn. So I live in a small apartment. There's nowhere to work out uh, besides my bedroom. So Irina maybe has better hobbies, but Cece's cooking Instagram is incredible. I've bookmarked so many things. She's yeah. done phenomenal with that channel. Yeah. Every single time I'm just like, oh, I should do that. I should do that. Yeah. It's really amazing to see all these tennis players getting involved on social media now. Like they have like the taste of tennis. So people have been going on and cooking dishes and then, like the tennis one app, like you see JC drawing a tennis racket with his girlfriend or uh, playing like a game. I don't know. I feel like a lot of people are getting more involved with social media during this time. Hey everyone, we're talking to Julia Albaba on the Tennis.com podcast about her brief stint on reality TV when she joined Bravo's Summer House for an episode. Keep listening. They're getting out of their shell too. They have to do something other than play tennis because they literally could not play tennis and not just because of an injury, which is a kind of a bit more natural of a hiatus, I think, for tennis players. But to be forced to find out like, hey, what are you besides a tennis player is hard. But speaking of, you know, you're also a New Yorker and the U.S. Open, it looks like it's going to happen without fans. As someone who grew up here, like what's your U.S. Open experience like? I know you've played it a few times as a junior and then the college event as well. So what's your U.S. Open and how weird would it be to not be able to go? So the best part about the U.S. Open, I feel like, is the fans. The, the U.S. Open being in New York has some of the craziest fans not the classiest fans, like maybe in Wimbledon, but they're just so dedicated, I feel like, in New York and so excited to watch good tennis, um, rowdy. And it, it just, it, the environment is electrifying. A New York, like a U.S. Open without its fans would be, who it'd be weird, but it's definitely better than not having a U.S. Open for sure, for many reasons, of course. But again, it's not like it's basketball where, you know, the fans are kind of cheering throughout the game and tennis, you know, it gets quiet during the point. I just feel like it can work. It's just a different feel. It's crazy that it feels crazy. Ugh. Uh, we we take it for granted. We're like, okay, four grand slams a year. You know, this is. And then now I'm saying one Grand Slam this year. This is insane. Like, it's weird to say. I wonder if, like, the big players are going to play. Like, I know Djokovic and Nadal have had some things to say about it. It'll be interesting. I feel like everyone at the moment, you know, kind of has a pretty hard set opinion on whether or not they're going to play. But come, you know, a couple months down the line, all of a sudden, you know, you're getting 95% of your prize money. I think you're going to show up, even if it means cutting down your entourage from 10 people to one. Uh, <laughs> it yeah. would be interesting to see that, you know, everyone on the same playing field with one or two people with, is that the rule one person with you? I think so. Nothing like, I think every rule and every guideline they come out with could change at any minute. But the idea is you wouldn't have Novak and his physio and trainer and his psychologist and his girlfriend mm-hmm. or his, oh, sorry, his wife, you know, like it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So I don't. I don't know. That'll be interesting, especially from like a recovery standpoint, because like not everyone is going to be able, well, now ev- nobody is going to be able to get fully recovered their massages and, you know, physios and stuff like that. It'd be interesting. I can't wait to see like Diego Schwartzman win the U.S. Open because <laughs> the top four guys don't show up. But like you guys would kill to play in the U.S. Open this this year. Any, I know it's a different scenario because it is a pandemic and it's not because the players are are being, you know, silly or arrogant. It's it's a delicate situation, but you guys would kill to play it. Like it's not, it's all about perspective. 100% would kill to play. Actually last year, because I was injured, I got to write for the U.S. Open, which was super interesting because I got to, you know, kind of take off my tennis player hat and put on my media hat, learn about like another side of tennis and kind of ask people their perspective on things and kind of like what you're doing to me right now. It's pretty (laughs) cool to see like different sides of the sport. 
It is. I feel like I've made Irina get into this side of the sport as well. Like you're used to being the talent and you're used to being the center of the attention. Then you're kind of having to adjust and interview other people. But at least for me, it's been rewarding because, you know, tennis is such a big part of my life and being able to hear from players of all different levels and different places they're from and all on different ages. And you can kind of relate, you know, and no matter what, like no matter what you do next, Julie, like you're going to relate to that athlete so much. Right. We have so much tennis experience and insight that we can use that experience and insight to form our questions. And we know deep down how we feel about something. So that will help us form our questions, like hoping to get like, you know, a similar answer of some sort or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I think just on, on top of that, it has been rewarding. So thank you, Nina, for getting me involved with this whole podcasting Mm -hmm. network thing. Um, But yeah, I think the most fun has been too. I mean, obviously I talked to players all the time on the tour, but it's getting to know, you know, the physios, the coaches, the people behind the scenes that run the tournaments. I mean, that's, that's been, I think the most like eye opening because you just really have no idea until you ask the question. For sure. Seeing different angles of the sport, you know, the people behind the scenes, that's so important. I really like, you know, when someone wins a grand slam, when they thank, you know, the people that you would never think of thanking, because those are the people that really make it happen. Speaking of Grand Slams, though, you have a photo on your Instagram again. I'm a stalker of you and Bianca Andreescu selfie at the U.S. <laughs> Open. Are you guys friends? What's the what's the story there? I know that she uh, she's awesome. She's very sweet. Uh, throughout those two weeks, I was doing media with her after every match and watching her get better and better. Each match was awesome. But I I have played her many times, like um, in ITFs or like even in some pro tournaments, mainly in doubles, never in singles, actually. So we just became friends through playing each other. And we were supposed to have dinner a couple of nights before her first round. But then I got tied up with some media stuff at uh, the US Open. So that couldn't happen, unfortunately. But I was like, telling her as a friend, like, I think like you're playing amazing and you have a great shot. And she's like, I know I can. I don't know if it will happen this year, but I know I'm playing well. I'm like, you really are. You you believe in yourself. And she's like, I never played on Ash before. It would be really cool to play on Ash this year. Yeah, she played on Ash that year. maybe like four times. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's impressive to see how, how that, that fortnight unfolded for her. And it's, you know, it's, it's incredible. It was just crazy because we were talking about it before her first round against Kaylee, Katie Volinets. And the fact that she was saying, it'd be so cool to play on Ash. It'd be so cool to have a night session. And then she went all the way. Oh man, that was cool. <laughs> Is it inspiring to see someone you know do so well? Or is there like a little part of you that's like a little bit almost almost jealous comes up where you're just like, that could be me or at least like I should be there and have a chance? So for me, I took it as inspiration because first of all, I was very injured at the time. Like I could barely like extend my arm last US Open. So seeing her made me want to rush my process of healing. So I was like, oh, the sooner I get better, the sooner I can get on court. But it made me, when you see peers doing well, it makes you realize that it's not so far away. Like you can do it too. And while I was jealous because she was out on the court when I couldn't barely extend my arm, I was also inspired and I was like, felt closer to a goal than I ever had. That's really how I took it. I love that. I love that it's not, yeah, that it can be a positive experience. And, you know, people always say like women on WTA players on tour aren't friends and they don't want what's best for each other. But I think in some cases, maybe not all, like they do. I don't know, Irina, like you have friends on tour, people that you you cheer on and support and lift up. It's not like women all are hating. I mean, yeah, I have a couple of friends on tour um, and Trust me, there are some catty women out there. There's going to be jealousy. There's going to be all that fun stuff. But at the end of the day, I mean, like Julia said, I mean, it can happen. It can happen. You know, if the stars are aligned, if everything works to plan, you know, you could be the person that wins the title that following week. Um, So I think it's just knowing that everybody's got their path. Um, And I think once you get to that maturity, 
it actually alleviates and takes all the pressure off because you're like, all right, you know, she had a good week this week. It's all good. You know, I'm not going to make it affect me. So I think understanding that and being able to accept that, that it's not going to be your week every single week, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Irina, you make a fabulous point um, because it's tennis an individual sport and you're competing against other girls. Of course, if a girl does better um, than you, one girl is going to always do the bet- better than any other player in that tournament. So, I mean, we're all going to feel a little amount of jealousy just because we not of the person as much as like wishing that we could have, you know, had that result. So that's just like natural and part of being in this individual sport. But I feel like once you're really happy and content with your own results, you can um, you can feel happy for other people's success. Um, but luckily every week there's a new chance. So I feel like we've, we've touched on like what maybe continues to drive certain players. Cause like right now, Julia, like you're, I think you're unranked. You have to start from zero, but you're thinking, Hey, every week is a new opportunity or will be a new opportunity. And it could be a turnaround for you. I think that's what drives so many pro players. Yeah. It's going to be hard starting from the bottom again. Um, it's definitely building on the previous week, taking the positives and negatives forward with you. Um, the best thing about having a tournament each week is being able to draw from like your past experience, which was a you know couple of days prior to your next match. Um, the hardest part is definitely dropping the negativity. Like, oh, I hit 15 to 20 double faults in that match, not getting tight in the next match kind of remembering the positives of maybe like what worked on the serve instead of what didn't work. So it's just, it's going to, yeah, building blocks and trying to figure it out. I have one last, one last question, you know, like talking about, we mentioned your college career and you were number one as a junior and you did so well at UVA, you made history there. Did you ever think about turning pro before finishing or was that never a thought? Before um, going to college, you mean? No, I meant before graduating. Did you ever think of leaving UVA? Because you sound, it sounds oh. like a no, but. Oh, okay. So yeah, I didn't plan on ever leaving UVA in, in the middle of my four years. I did have a thought of possibly going pro before UVA, but not, not nearly enough, like to just give up the education and stuff. I wasn't where I wanted to be, where I could be like, yeah, I'm ready to go pro from a maturity standpoint, a game standpoint. So no, I think the plan was, you know, to play um, college tennis and finish that up. And I'm happy with that decision for sure. It was a good plan. It ended up working out just fine. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's just, it's hard with the injuries. It is. I'm hoping I'm hoping you get back out there soon. I hope everyone can get back out there really soon as it looks like the pandemic might be possibly easing and tournaments will start popping up. So Julia, I hope we see you back on court soon, healthy, winning, or just being happy, running around, doing what you love to do. So we really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Irina and Nina. <laughs> um, it was so great being on here with you guys. Thanks so much, girl. Appreciate it. Thank you. From the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, this has been the Tennis.com Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to stay caught up. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and every major listening app, as well as Tennis.com slash podcasts. You can also see the videos of our episodes on Tennis Channel's YouTube page and Tennis.com's Facebook page. We're your hosts, Nina Pantic and Irina Falcone. We'd like to thank our team, editor and audio designer and video editor, Christina Koseva, producers Alexa March and Sean O'Malley, and executive producers Shelby Coleman, Kyle Einhorn, and Andy Chu.